Hello, and welcome to our course on the Lake House with Delta Lake. This course is an introductory one, but it is a deep dive into topics like the Lake House architectural pattern. The Lake House is a new architectural pattern which offers first class support for machine learning and data science, as well as state of the art performance for business intelligence and reporting. My name is Kevin, and I am a curriculum developer here at Databricks. In a past life, I was a data scientist. I bring that up because this course is technical in many areas, and we'll definitely give our hands on the keyboard with some code. We'll be covering high-level concepts, and it is assumed that you are unfamiliar with both the Lake House and Delta Lake. But we'll definitely be covering Python code. If you are a data engineer, a data scientist, a platform administrator, or even a technical business leader, this course is great for you. I don't, however, want to discourage anyone from this course as there are substantial amounts of conceptual knowledge that we'll cover that I believe are suitable for just about anyone and any audience member interested in data. We'll set the stage by discussing some challenges we've seen in the modern data landscape. After that, we're going to see how Delta Lake enables the lake house. We'll give some conceptual foundation to how Delta Lake overcomes many of the challenges discussed in item number one. Once we have an idea of the challenges and how to overcome those, we can discuss some high level architecture. We call section three, the lake house design. We'll introduce a pattern that we call the Delta Lake architecture or the medallion architecture, named after its gold, silver, and bronze style layers. We'll then distinguish the lake house from other enterprise architectures, which are similar in spirit to the lake house architecture and not necessarily competing, but have their own distinct properties. At that point, I'll be ready to dive in and start with some code. We'll open up the Databricks platform, load in our data and review and visualize it. Once we do that, we can discuss moving data from a common file format called Parquet into Delta format. After we do that in code, we'll want to discuss components that Delta Lake is made up of. We'll discuss three, the Delta table, the commit service, and the Delta engine. This course has several objectives. By the end of this, you should be able to define core characteristics of the Lakehouse architecture. You should be able to explain how Delta Lake supports the lake house architecture, explain how to build an end-to-end -end batch and streaming OLAP data pipeline using Delta Lake. We'll discuss OLAP when we get there. Follow specified design patterns to make data available for consumption by downstream stakeholders. And explain Databricks' recommended best practices in engineering a single source of truth using the Delta design pattern. Let's start at the organizational level. If you've worked in data, you're probably familiar with the idea of data existing in silos, but why does this happen? It's no secret to data practitioners that most enterprises struggle with data. The challenge usually starts with the architecture. This can look like trying to handle four different ways of processing data based on the type of data. So for example, an enterprise might see data warehousing as one concern that is handled differently than say streaming data, which is handled differently than say unstructured data that a data science team uses to create machine learning models. You then need to build four different stacks to handle all of your data workloads. They're very different technologies and generally they don't work well together. This architectural complexity is further hampered by the overall ecosystem. What ends up happening is that disparate systems and tools are forced to couple together like Frankenstein's monster. Sure, it's alive, but it's scary. Enterprises then have tons of different tools to power each architecture. It's a whole slew of different open source tools, managed open source, and software as a service or SaaS based third party tools that you have to connect together. Even worse, when we deal with many third-party providers in, say, the data warehousing stack, you're often dealing with proprietary data formats. 
enterprises end up locked into formats for years and migrating data when system migrations happen become massive undertakings. And if you want to enable advanced use cases, you have to move the data across stacks from say the data warehouse and streaming systems into a data science and machine learning stack. It ends up being expensive and resource intensive to manage. And all of this complexity is felt by your data teams. Because the systems are siloed, the teams become siloed too. Sometimes this whole idea of complexity works the other way around, for example. An example of this could be those who create org charts become accidental data architects. And what do we mean by that? Well, if we have four teams of data professionals, not even accounting for the other lines of business in the organization, which might have data people on their team, each of those teams left to their own devices might begin to use tools most familiar to their workflow. They then begin to store data in the way that best suits their use case. Communication slows down, which hinders innovation and speed, and different teams end up with different versions of the truth. The result of this is that multiple copies of the data exist, there's no consistent security or governance model, you have closed systems with disconnected and less productive data teams. The core problem here is the technologies that these stacks are built upon. Let's think about how we got here from a technical perspective. We'll walk through a 30 second history of data architectures. First, we had the data warehouse. The concept of the data warehouse was created around the same time that cassette tapes were created. And since then, data warehouses have seen many iterations. Data warehouses have a long history in decision support and business intelligence applications, though they were not designed for handling unstructured data, semi-structured data, and data with high variety, velocity, and volume. Some of those iterations mentioned earlier were attempts to bridge those gaps. Data lakes emerged to handle raw data in a variety of formats on cheap storage for data science and machine learning though typically data lakes lacked critical features from the world of data warehouses. Let's talk about the emergence of data lakes then. Data lakes present a new paradigm in data management and they offer many benefits as well as many advantages over traditional data warehouses. So let's examine a few of those advantages. They provide cheap storage that is incredibly durable. Organizations can store many different varieties of data. And the data you store can be in open formats, meaning that what you're storing probably plays nicely with other tools in the data ecosystem. From this, we see a common two-tier data architecture. So data teams will consistently stitch these systems together to enable business intelligence, or BI, and ML, or machine learning across data in both of these systems, resulting in duplicate data, extra infrastructure costs, security challenges, and significant operational costs. In a two-tier data architecture, data is extracted, transformed, and loaded, also called ETL'd, from the operational databases into a data lake. This lake stores data from the entire enterprise in a low cost object storage and is stored in a format compatible with common machine learning tools. But it is often not organized, nor is it maintained well. Then a small segment of the critical business data is ETL'd once again and loaded into the data warehouse for business intelligence and data analytics. Due to multiple ETL steps, this two-tier architecture requires regular maintenance and often results in data staleness. So quickly, some problems are emerging. Data lakes, like their data warehouse predecessors, have challenges. The first challenge is that it's hard to append data to data that is spread across many files like we see in a data lake. For example, Something as simple as just appending new data becomes really difficult when you're appending new records into the many files that you typically find in a data lake. The consequence here is that the difficulty in trying to append data cleanly makes trying to read data in its most up-to-date format difficult, or even worse, it is incorrect. 
Another way of saying this is that newly appended records should be showing up, but we have to manually engineer a process in order to append data. Stakeholders and end users want changes to data to appear as though it's being added to the bottom of a table, but data in a data lake is not often one giant table. Appending data was thus hard to achieve before Delta Lake because making records append across multiple files appear all at once was not supported out of the box with data lakes in the same way that it was with a data warehouse. The second challenge is that modification of data is hard. With governing rules like GDPR and CCPA, it's required that we have the ability to modify and update data at fairly granular levels. So for example, if a user does not want their data to be stored, you have to be able to delete data associated with just that user. And if you have that data in a data lake, how do you delete this single record? Writing loops over large amounts of data can be incredibly costly from a compute perspective. These sorts of manual techniques would rewrite entire petabates on the data lake once a week to only sort of clean it of the things that need to be removed. Third is the issue of jobs failing midway through. So for example, sometimes if you have a streaming job with always on nodes in a cluster, one of those nodes or the whole cluster will go down. Even worse, on top of that, if the job was failing silently, then months later when you're trying to access data, only half of the data is there. Fourth, organizations have been promised that they can provide insight in real time about operations. There are many gotchas here. Mixing streaming and batch can easily lead to inconsistency. This adding of data by mixing of streaming and batch is a variation of the first problem mentioned where it can be hard to append data to a data lake. But with this variation of the appending problem, mixing real-time operations and batch leads to inconsistencies where you're reading partial results. Fifth, many regulated organizations need to keep all the versions of their data and they need a way to reproduce any data set they ever had for auditing and governance reasons. It turns out that this is very hard to do. So what they would do is, again, manually make many copies and snapshots of data. This is not only time intensive, but it's also very costly. The sixth challenge we see is that it is really difficult to handle large metadata. If you have petabytes of data in the data lake, then the metadata itself can easily size in gigabytes. And most of the metadata catalogs in the data ecosystem cannot support these types of sizes. Seven, we have the too many file problem. Again, since data lakes are file based, you end up with maybe millions of tiny files or maybe you have two really gigantic files. In either case, this impacts performance. Eight, on that same note, it's just generally hard to get great performance. You have to do a lot of manual techniques like partitioning. And these techniques are, of course, error prone. And last but not least, all of these issues eventually lead up to data quality issues. It's really hard to ensure that your data is correct and clean. It is especially hard though in the big data world because you can't skim through your data manually to see if it looks okay. Now that we've got an idea of the state of modern data management systems, including nine challenges with a popular system, the data lake, as well as some background on the data warehouse and its limitations, let's discuss a new way forward, the lake house. Delta Lake enables the lake house, but what is the lake house and what is Delta Lake? The Databricks lake house platform combines the best elements of data lakes and data warehouses to deliver the reliability, strong governance, and performance of data warehouses with the openness, flexibility, and machine learning support of data lakes. This unified approach simplifies your modern data stack by eliminating the data silos that traditionally separate and complicate data engineering, analytics, BI, data science, and machine learning. 
it's built on open source and open standards to maximize flexibility. And its common approach to data management, security, and governance helps you operate more efficiently and innovate faster. The lake house is fully realized by many customers on the Databricks platform, or said another way, Databricks enables the lake house. Let's quickly recap some points about data lakes and data warehouses before we jump into the lake house. First, data lakes and data warehouses have complementary but different benefits that have required both to exist in most enterprise environments. Data lakes do a great job supporting machine learning. They have open formats and a big ecosystem, but they have poor support for business intelligence and suffer complex data quality problems. Data warehouses are great for BI applications, but they have limited support for ML workloads, and they are proprietary systems with only an interface for structured query language, also called SQL or just SQL if you're in the know. So obviously there are differences, pros and cons, between warehouses and data lakes. Unifying these systems can be transformational in how we think about data. And that's exactly what the Lakehouse does. It unifies your workloads. The key enabler behind this innovation is Delta Lake. Delta Lake provides an ability to build the curated data lakes that add reliability, performance, and governance that you'd expect from data warehouses directly to your existing data lakes. You gain reliability with ACID transactions. Now you can be sure that all operations in the data lake either fully succeed or fail with the ability to easily time travel backward to understand every change made to your data. Additionally, Delta Lake is underpinned by Apache Spark and utilizes advanced caching and indexing methods. This allows you to process and query data on your data lake extremely quickly at scale. Finally, Delta Lake provides support for fine grained access control lists or ACLs or ACLs, if you're also in the know, to give you much more control over who can access what data in your data lake. With this foundation, let's look at the lake house and how Delta helps us overcome those challenges that we mentioned earlier. Delta Lake was built to be a structured transactional layer that supports the lake house architecture. It is uniquely suited to address every one of those challenges. So let's revisit those challenges and see how Delta Lake addresses them. Delta Lake brings ACID transactionality to our data lake. Let's pause though. I've said ACID transactions a few times without defining that phrase. ACID transactions might be a new phrase to you or maybe not but let's just recap to make sure that we're using the same definitions. We're going to start with that second word. What is a transaction? In the context of databases and data storage systems, a transaction is any operation that is treated as a single unit of work, which either completes fully or does not complete at all and leaves the storage system in a consistent state. The classic example of a transaction what occurs when you withdraw money from your bank account. Either the money has left your bank account or it has not. There cannot be an in-between state. ACID is an acronym which consists of four properties. Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. It refers to four properties that define a transaction. If a database operation has these ACID properties, it can be called an ACID transaction. And data storage systems that apply these operations are called transactional systems. ACID transactions guarantee that each read, write, or modification of a table has those four properties. Let's go through those. First off, we have atomicity. Each statement in a transaction to read, write, update, or delete data is treated as a single unit. You can kind of think of like an atom. Either the entire statement is executed or none of it is executed. This property prevents data loss and corruption from occurring. 
if, for example, your streaming data source fails midstream. The C, consistency, ensures that transactions only make changes to tables in predefined, predictable ways. Transactional consistency ensures that corruption or errors in your data do not create unintended consequences for the integrity of your table. Isolation. When multiple users are reading and writing from the same table all at once, isolation of their transactions ensures that the concurrent transactions don't interfere with or affect one another. Each request can occur as though they were occurring one by one, even though they're actually occurring simultaneously. And finally, the D, durability, ensures that changes to your data made by successfully executed transactions will be saved, even in the event of system failure. Acid transactions are something that data lakes lacked in the past, and it's useful to think about acid transactionality as a standard by which we can judge data systems. While it's not enforced or guaranteed, many data warehouses have acid transactionality. And again, data lakes lacked it until Delta Lake enabled it. Let's recap those nine challenges listed earlier, and then we can see how acid transactionality provided by Delta Lake helps address those challenges. Those challenges were hard to append data, modification of existing data was difficult, jobs failing midway, real-time operations are hard, it is costly to keep historical data versions. It's difficult to handle large metadata. The too many files problems. Poor performance. And data quality issues. We're now going to discuss acid transactionality in the context of the nine challenges of data lakes. Acid transactions have long been one of the most enviable properties of data warehouses, but Delta Lake has now brought them to data lakes. The first five challenges are actually addressed by acid transactions. Delta bringing acid transactionality is a way in which we make every operation on your data lake transactional. This means that every operation you do in your data lake either fully succeeds or we abort it and clean up any residue so that you can't notice it and you can retry it later. Delta Lake does this by keeping a transaction log of every operation, and it makes sure that everything is consistent with that transaction log. This also allows you to mix real-time and batch because real-time and batch operations are just transactions. Finally, Delta enables you to do time travel. Since we have all the deltas, all of these differences in the transaction log, in other words, we can actually go back in time and look at any version of the data. So now we can do appends because the transaction log makes sure that those appends are consistent. Real-time operations will be consistent and the historical data versions will be there as well. and all transactions are recorded and you can go back in time and review previous versions of the data. How does Delta Lake handle large metadata? Well, there it just uses Spark under the hood. So we use Spark for actually managing metadata, which enables us to scale infinitely. All Delta Lake metadata is stored in open Parquet format. Portions of it are cached and they are optimized for fast access. Data and its metadata always coexist. And there's no need to keep the catalog and data in sync because of this. To help address performance issues, Delta Lake has indexing. We have partitioning, but we also have things like bloom filters and data skipping which are various statistical techniques that let us, when we get a query, look at the data and actually avoid reading big portions of the data altogether. Therefore, we get massive speedups. We have z-ordering, which lets us lay out the data in a way that you can actually have multiple columns that are all optimized. 
And then finally, we have auto optimize, which periodically relays out the data in the background so that it's optimized for later usage. So for instance, if you have lots of tiny files, auto optimize will compact them and make them sort of consolidated, if you will, into a bigger file. How do we make sure that we can deal with data quality issues? Here, Delta comes with schema validation. This means that all data that goes into a Delta table must adhere strictly to a schema. This ensures that it always satisfies that particular schema. If it doesn't, we move that data into quarantine where you can go look at it later and fix it. Let's jump into it then. What does the architecture behind a lake house look like? The Delta architecture design pattern describes how raw data will be transformed and loaded into successively cleaner Delta Lake tables. Bronze tables hold raw data, data that is coming in from a source. We apply transformations to make clean silver tables. Once data is cleaned, it can be aggregated into gold level tables, as shown in this graphic. In this system, data analysts are an end user and working with gold or silver level data that comes through this pipeline. It is important to notice that the whole data team is working in a single unified system that is reliable and up to date. Also notice that the input source data can be streaming or batch, and we can output assets that are either streaming or batch. All data flows through the same pipeline. Teams can access that elusive single source of truth on which all organizations want to base their decisions. The Delta Lake architecture is a vast improvement upon the traditional Lambda architecture, which we'll speak about in a moment. At each stage, we enrich our data through a unified pipeline that allows us to combine batch and streaming workflows through a shared file store with ACID compliant transactions. Each stage can be configured as a batch or streaming job and atomic transactions ensure that they succeed or fail completely. The end outputs are actionable insights, dashboards, and reports of business metrics. By considering our business logic at all steps of the ETL pipeline, we can ensure that storage and compute costs are optimized by reducing unnecessary duplication of data and limiting ad hoc querying against full historical data. Let's talk about each of those layers. Bronze tables contain raw data ingested from various sources, JSON files, relational database management system data, internet of things data, etc. We can keep all of the data in inexpensive commodity objects, such as we see typically in a data lake with our bronze layer. Data in a bronze table often has long retention, think years, and can be saved as is, avoiding error-prone parsing at this stage. Silver tables will provide a more refined view of our data. We can join fields from various bronze tables to enrich streaming records or update account statuses based on recent activity. Events are cleaned and normalized, sometimes joined with dimension information. Gold tables provide business level aggregates often used for reporting and dashboarding. This would include aggregations such as daily active website users, weekly sales per store, or gross revenue per quarter by department, usually related to one particular business objective. 
Now that we've looked at the big picture with big data, and let's discuss some benefits of the lake house architecture. Some benefits of the lake house architecture with Delta Lake include separation of compute and storage. The separation of com computation and storage makes it easier to allocate resources elastically. We can stretch up or stretch down as necessary. A data lake house is the least expensive option for building a single source of truth. Organizations pay for compute only when needed. There's infinite storage cap capacity. With the unlimited availability of cloud-based object storage, organizations do not need to worry about running out of space. We can leverage the best aspects of a data warehouse. Using a data warehouse as a query layer means that all of the advantages of a data warehouse can be leveraged for reads. There is low data gravity. The organization's cloud object store keeps data in the format of choice. This arrangement has the lowest data gravity, meaning it is easiest to move from here to any other location or format. There's high data throughput. High data throughput refers to this architecture's ability to handle a much higher volume of data per unit time. There are no limits on data structure. Using a data lake as the single source of truth means that there are no limits to the kinds of data that can be ingested. A data lake is a not only SQL system, meaning that it can support structured as well as semi-structured and unstructured data. And we can mix batch and streaming workloads. Building a system with Apache Spark and Delta Lake means that the system benefits from the structured streaming capabilities of Apache Spark. We'd also like to make sure that we're distinguishing the lake house from other architectures that you might have heard of. Let's go over two related but still markedly different architectures. One way that engineers approach the idea that streaming and batch data need to exist in the same system was to form what was called the Lambda architecture. This architecture essentially creates two streams of data, one for streaming and one for batch data. This approach essentially is the same pipeline, but duplicated for the two types of data. The goal of the data engineer is to process batch and streaming data in a continuous, incremental, and cost-effective way. As you can see from this diagram, there are many complexities that make this quite challenging. Fortunately though, Delta Lake makes this possible by simplifying these complexities. A newer architectural and organization pattern has also come into fashion known as a data mesh. A data mesh is a decentralized connection of data products, which you might also hear called data assets. We see the lake house and specifically the Delta Lake architecture or the medallion architecture as complementary, not competing with the goals of a data mesh. For example, on the slide, we can see many data assets each which might have their own bronze, silver, and gold delta tables. Now that we have a conceptual idea of how our lake house is designed, let's switch over to the platform and begin to code it up. We'll start by importing the notebooks used for our code, and then when we've got everything imported and set up, we'll open our data set and explore it a bit. I'll see you over in the Databricks platform. As an aside, whenever you see a slide that has this same design with the letters LWD followed by a number, 
we're about to go over into the Databricks platform. If you want to get a little bit ahead, once you see this slide, you can go ahead and open up the notebook with the corresponding letters and numbers. So for example, if you already had the DBC file loaded into your workspace, you could open up notebook LWD01 and I will meet you there. The first thing we'll need to do is obtain all of the notebooks for our course. What we can do is head over to files.training.databricks.com and then everything else that you see at the end of this URL. If we click on notebooks, it will trigger a download for a DBC file. A DBC file is a Databricks compressed file. You can think of it like a zip file. Once our download's complete, we can head over to the platform and I'll show you how to import a DBC into your workspace. Now I'm over in the Databricks platform. A couple quick notes. I've already downloaded the DBC, which contains all of the notebooks for this lesson. Also, I'm in the data science and engineering persona. I'm not in the machine learning and I'm not in the SQL. You could be in the machine learning persona if you'd like, but the SQL persona wouldn't work for this lesson. The first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that I have a cluster set up. To set up a cluster, you would click on the cluster compute icon. And then if you need to create a cluster, I've already got a cluster turned on. Then I'm going to open up a workspace and navigate to my end username. From here, I'm going to click on the down arrow and then click import. I'm going to drag my DBC file into the box. Once it's uploaded, I can click import. And now Lake House with Delta Lake Deep Dive appears in my workspace. I'm going to open up the first notebook, LWD, Lake House with Delta, 00, zero getting started by clicking on the title. Up at the top, I can see that I haven't attached this notebook to my cluster. So I'm going to click on the down arrow and then attach to my cluster. Great job so far. We've gone through issues with the modern data stack, the emergence of data lakes, and some challenges that are associated with data lakes. Then we've talked about the lake house. A key enabler for the lake house is a tool called Delta Lake. Delta Lake helps us address some of those challenges that we see in data lakes. In the next section, we'll start out with some code. Let's get started. In this notebook, you're going to ingest data from a remote source into our source directory called raw. What we'll do to ingest our data is to run the following cell. This will configure our course's environment. Let's click inside the cell where it says percent sign run and then dot includes classroom setup. What this does is run a notebook from the includes directory that's called classroom setup. And if we look by clicking on workspace includes, and I'm going to command click on my Mac classroom setup so that it opens a new tab. And I take a look at the classroom setup I can see all of the functions and helper utilities that I need for this class. I also see at the top that I have another percent run sign 
that runs a utility functions notebook. And that one exists right here, utility functions. So jumping back over to our notebook, I'm going to click inside of this cell, which says command four, hold down on the shift key and press enter to run the key. This now installs the data set and creates a local copy. Let's check out our data set. We're going to create a Python variable called files. Then we'll use the dbutils to list out the files underneath da databricksacademy.paths.raw. Then we'll use the display function on that object, the files object to get a nice printout of all of the files that exist. Awesome. So I can see now that I have at this certain path, a JSON object that has this name, health underscore tracker underscore data underscore 2020 underscore one with this size and this modification time. Now let's go through a sample exercise. Using the dbutils object, and the path defined by da.paths.working underscore dir directory list the files in this new directory. Whenever we have an exercise in this course, you'll see a commented line at the top that says to do. That's your chance to type something in. If you ever get lost in the video, feel free to check out the solutions where we can find all of the code and the answers. So in this case, we're going to take files and then the same exact pattern that we saw up above, dbutils.fs.ls in this path, da.paths.working directory, and that will list out the files for us. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste, but if you're typing out, I'll give you a couple seconds to give some time. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste, but if you're typing this, have no fear. I'll give you a couple seconds to type this all out. Okay, let's run this cell. I'm gonna hold down on shift and press enter. And now I can see that at this particular path, I have a database.db with size zero and modification time right here. Let's just run a quick assert test to make sure that we have the right set of files. We should have a length of files of one, which is the expected amount. If that's correct, then we see all tests passed. Great job importing our data set. Let's check out LWD01 review and visualize. I can see my cluster isn't attached, so I'm gonna go ahead and attach to my running cluster. In this notebook, we're going to open up that health tracker data that we downloaded and mounted in the previous notebook. A common use case for working with Delta Lake is to collect and process Internet of Things or IoT data. In our health tracker data, we have mock IoT sensor data for demonstration purposes. This simulates heart rate data that maybe was measured by a health tracker device. So once again, we're gonna run our classroom setup.
Okay, now that that's complete, we're gonna go and view our data. Our data should look something like this. Something like a key with a value pair. Key with a value pair. The schema for our health tracker data should look like a name, which is, has the type string, a heart rate, which has the type double, a device ID, which has the type integer, and then the time, which has the type long. We're going to load the data into our data set. In order to load the data set, let's go ahead and create a variable. I'll call this variable file underscore path. And we're going to use that same pattern and same place that we read our data in from last time. This time we're going to use spark.read and we're going to set the format to JSON or JavaScript object notation after we pass the load function in the path that we saw earlier. So let's go ahead and create a string for our path. I like using F formatting. DA.paths.raw. And then we saw that at the end of that there were JSON objects. So we'll use health underscore tracker underscore data underscore 2020 underscore one dot Jason. If you need a little help, you can look at the previous notebook and we can see that that's where those objects are located. Okay, and then the next thing I wanna do is read in our data. So I'm gonna create a variable called health underscore tracker underscore data underscore 2020 and this is the first file so I'll just name it under one data frame and then I'm gonna do just like we see in the instructions spark dot read dot format and this is JSON and then I want to load from that file path Okay, I like writing code that is more vertical. It's easier for me to read. So I'm gonna wrap this in parentheses and then use auto format like that. So now I have health tracker underscore data underscore 2020 underscore one underscore data frame DF. And then I'm reading in the JSON object from that particular file path. Awesome. Okay, now let's go ahead and display that data. This command has already been written out for us, so if we do display on that exact same object name that we see up above, we would display back information. A couple really neat features. We could configure a visualization so in this case, if we see on the far left, we have a table as our default visual on our data. But if we click on the bar chart right next to it, we could display bar charts. A newer function as well is to use the data profile tab, which runs summary statistics. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this course, but it is a neat feature. Now that we have a little bit better of an idea of the data that we're working on, let's go ahead and talk about Parquet. We'll talk about Parquet and then we'll come back to creating Parquet tables from this particular data set. I'll see you back over in the slides.
Next, we'll explore this architecture as implemented with Delta Lake and why is it the best option for building an enterprise decision support service. Earlier, we mentioned that data in data lakes is often in a file format. For this course, we're going to be using Parquet files and JSON files. In case you never worked with Parquet files, they are an open source format meaning that there is no proprietary software that you need to open them. Working with Parquet is great because we often see large speed gains. These gains are due to the way that Parquet stores data, column-wise instead of row-wise, like other formats such as comma-separated values, CSVs, or Avro. This naturally lends to being read by distributed workers like those that Spark gives you power over. There are also things that can go wrong with Parquet files. You still might have small files. You might end up with data skew issues where certain files cause more load time than other ones and they skew your cluster's resources. And we still need to be mindful of corrupt data. Converting Parquet to Delta can overcome many of these challenges. Consistency can overcome our corrupt data issue, for example, and with some other benefits like the idea that we can do direct updates on data. We can also do time travel, which are implicit snapshots. We're going to jump over to the platform now and we'll create a parquet table. Go ahead and open up LWD02. Now over in the Databricks platform, I've opened up LWD02 creating a parquet table. I've also gone ahead and attached my cluster. If you haven't done so, go ahead and do that now. The first thing we're going to do towards the end of creating a parquet table is run our classroom setup script. Then I'm going to reload data to a data frame. I'm using that same pattern that I saw earlier where I declare a string called file path and then I load in a data frame using spark.read.format. This time I've written my code horizontal just in case that freaked you out the last time. Let's go ahead and create a parquet table. The first step we want to do in our notebooks is to make all of our notebooks idempotent, meaning that we could run them and we'd expect the same result. So we'll, to that end, we're going to remove files in the processed directory. Then we're going to drop a table that we create from the Metastore if that table exists. This step will make the notebook idempotent. We can run it more than once without throwing errors or introducing extra files. Throughout this lesson, we'll be writing files to the root location of the Databricks file system, DBFS. In general, it's best practice to write files to your cloud object storage. We use DBFS root here for demonstration purposes. So let's use dbutils.fs.rm and then we will drop a table if it exists. With the percent SQL directive, you can write SQL directly into our notebook instead of using the Python APIs. In this command though, we're actually doing that using spark.sql, drop table if exists. Step two for us is to transform the data. We're going to perform transformations by selecting columns in the following ways. We'll use the from Unix time to transform the time column and we'll cast that as date. 
as a date, and then we'll alias that column to DTE. Then we'll use from underscore Unix time to transform time, cast it as a timestamp, and then we'll alias that as time. Heart rate is selected just as it is. Name will be selected just as it is. And then we're going to cast the device underscore ID as an integer that is aliased to P underscore device underscore ID. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to do is import from PySpark dot SQL dot functions the call and from underscore Unix time functions. Then I'm going to create a function. So I'm thinking about my functions as data frame in and data frame out. I like writing functions so that my code's reusable. I'll call this function exactly what it's going to do. Process health tracker data. It'll take in a data frame. And then it's going to return back a data frame. This data frame, though, is going to do all of the things in the bullet points up above. So I'm going to select from Unix time, the time column, I'm going to cast it as a date object. And then I'm going to alias that as DTE. The next thing I want to do is similar. I'm taking that Unix time in there. And this time I'm going to cast it as a timestamp. So nothing too fancy that I'm doing in the realm of processing my data. At this level, we're still kind of thinking about data kind of in that bronze layer. Now I have two columns from that one column, the time column. My new columns are called DTE and time. The first one, DTE, is a date, and then the time column is a timestamp. I'm forgetting commas already, I can see. Then I want to leave the heart rate column as is. I'm going to leave the name column as is. And then I'm going to use that call function to grab the device ID. I'm first going to cast it as an integer. And then I'm going to take that and alias it as P underscore device underscore ID. A little bit of cleanup of my code, and I'm ready to go. The last thing I want to do is now that I've made this function, is to use it. So I'm going to create a data frame called processed underscore DF that's assigned to this function. And I'm going to take the health tracker data frame that should exist now. And I'm going to basically process the data frame as it was into a slightly processed data frame. OK, great. If I want to see the output now, I can click on the down arrow. I can see DTE is of type date, time is of type timestamp, heart rate is a double, name is a string, and then P underscore device ID is an integer. The next thing I want to do is write that file to a process directory. Here, I'm going to be partitioning the data by device ID. So you might have been asking, 
why did we prepend device ID with P underscore? That's a way for me to denote that this is the column that I'm going to be partitioning on. We're going to write this out using parquet format, and we'll specify the partition on the P underscore device ID. Let's go for it. We have our processed data frame that we write. And I'm going to go ahead and just wrap this whole thing in parentheses because I like the vertical style. The mode that I'm writing is overwrite in case it exists already. Then I want to dot format it as parquet so that I'm writing it out to parquet format. Then I'm going to define how I partition by by passing in the p underscore device underscore id and then finally where i'm going to save it to is da dot paths dot processed okay great now I'm going to register that table in the Metastore. So I'm going to use Spark SQL to do this. I'm going to drop the table if it exists, then I'll create a table called health underscore tracker underscore processed using Parquet. It's going to look at that same place where I wrote out my Parquet file too. In step five, let's verify that we have a parquet based data lake table at this time. So in order to do that, I'm going to read in and count the records. So I'll do health underscore tracker underscore processed. And that's going to take a spark dot read dot table health tracker processed and then we're going to count the records so I'll take health tracker process dot count Okay, I can see now that the count does not return results. Let's go ahead and register the partitions. We have created a partition table, which is best practice. But if you create a partition table from existing data, Spark SQL does not automatically discover the partitions and register them in the Metastore. M SCK repair table will register the partitions in the Hive Metastore. And if you want more information on this, you can look in the documentation. So I'm going to run MSCK repair table on health tracker processed. And now I'm going to count the records in the health tracker process table. With the table repaired and the partitions registered, we should have now results. So I'm going to say save the total of the health tracker processed dot count and then we'll just write like a simple assert statement that can kind of mimic a unit test total we think that there should be 3720 And we expected 3720 records, but we found 
this many. Maybe we'll just add in a print statement here, just in case. F total I missed a comma. Okay, so I passed my assert statement and I got down to the total here. The total registered was 3720. Looks like I did everything correct. We're getting a little lower level now. Delta has several subcomponents that we should now discuss. What is Delta Lake comprised of, you might be asking. There are basically three higher level components that we'll go over for Delta Lake. Delta Tables, the Commit Service, and the Delta Engine. Delta Tables are one of the first abstractions of data that are important to understand. So what's the difference between a parquet table and a delta table? Delta still uses a format and we're reading from files. However, it provides an additional layer over these files with advanced features. Some of those advanced features include things like merge operations, updates and insert operations. This means that delta tables provide things like a transaction log, which provides metadata and a layer for consistency. Data is still in Parquet, but our delta log file, as we can see in our path, is created when we convert our tables from Parquet to delta tables. Before Delta Lake, a common design pattern was to partition the first stage of data by a batch ID so that if a failure occurred upon ingestion, the partition could be dropped and a new one created on retry. Although this pattern helps with ETL recoverability, it usually results in many partitions with a few smart, small parquet files, thereby impeding downstream query performance. This is typically rectified by duplicating the data into other tables with broader partitions. Delta Lake still supports partitions, but you only need them to match the expected query patterns and only if each partition contains a substantial amount of data. This ends up eliminating many partitions in your data and improves performance by scanning fewer files. With Delta Tables, Spark allows you to merge different parquet schemas together with the Merge Schema option. With a regular parquet data lake, the schema can differ across these partitions, but not within partitions. However, a Delta Lake table does not have this same constraint. Delta Lake gives an engineer a choice to either allow the schema of a table to evolve or to enforce the schema upon write. If an incompatible schema change is detected, Delta Lake will throw an exception and prevent the table from being corrupted with columns that have incompatible types. Additionally, a Delta Lake table may include not null constraints on columns, which cannot be enforced on a regular Part K table. This prevents records from being loaded with null values for columns which require data and could break downstream processes. Delta Lake prevents data corruption by supporting the merge statement. Many tables are structured to be append only. However, it is not uncommon for duplicate records to enter pipelines. By using a merge statement, a pipeline can be configured to insert a new record or ignore records that are already present in the data Delta table. Delta Lake also has several properties that can make the same query much faster compared to regular Parquet. Rather than performing an expensive list operation on the blob storage for each query, which is what a regular Parquet reader would do, the Delta transaction log serves as the manifest. We'll look at the Delta transaction log in just a moment. 
Now that we have an idea of some advantages that delta tables have over out-of-the-box parquet, let's create those delta tables. I'll see you over in the platform with notebook LWD03. Okay, so I'm back over in the platform and I've opened up LWD03 and then I've attached to a running cluster 10.4. In this notebook, we're going to create delta tables. The objective here is to convert the parquet tables from the previous notebook into a delta table. Recall that a delta table has three things. First, it has data files that are kept in object storage. So that might be something like Amazon's S3 or Azure's data lake storage. There is a delta transaction log that is saved with the data files in object storage. And then there's a table that is registered in the Metastore. This step is optional, but usually we recommend it. Let's go ahead and get started by running the includes classroom setup cell. With Delta Lake, you create Delta tables. When ingesting new files into a Delta table for the first time, and you create new tables by transforming existing Parquet-based Data Lake tables to Delta tables. Throughout this section, we'll be writing files to the root location of DBFS. In general though, it's best practice to write files to your cloud object storage. We use DBFS root here for demonstration purposes. The first step that we'll do is to describe the health tracker process tables. Before we convert the health tracker process table, let's use Spark SQL and the describe command with the optional parameter extended to display the attributes of our table. Note that the table has the provider field listed as Parquet. So we're going to run drop table if exists. Then we'll create that table. We'll use Parquet in that path where our Parquet file exists. And then we'll use the describe extended health tracker processed command. Okay, so by looking at our table, we can see that we have our alias columns that we created in the previous notebook, DTE and time, as well as the partition device ID. Finally, we see at the bottom that there is partition information. If we scroll down to the very, very bottom, we can see detailed information. So this is where the database is located, along with the table, the owner, when it was created, and so on. Okay, let's convert the files over to Delta files. First, we're going to convert all of the files in place to Delta files. That conversion creates a Delta Lake transaction log that tracks associated files. We're gonna import from delta.tables, delta table. Then we're gonna write in the path where our parquet table exists. Then we'll talk about the partitioning screen scheme, which was our P underscore device ID column, which has the type int. Then we're going to take delta table and a method on that convert to delta We'll use Spark, the Parquet table listed here in line three, and then the partitioning screen. When that's finished, we're going to register the Delta table. At this point, the files containing our records have been converted over to Delta tables. 
The meta store, however, has not been updated to reflect that change. In this, we're going to change so that we re-register the table in the meta store. Spark SQL command using Delta will automatically infer the data schema by reading the footers of the Delta files. So we could drop the table if it exists. We'll create that table using Delta from that location. Then maybe we want to add some column comments. Comments can make tables easier to read and maintain. We're going to use an alter table command to add a new column comments to the existing Delta table. So I say alter table, health tracker process, and I'm going to replace the columns. We have the DTE column, and then maybe we say something like, here's the format of that column, or here's the name column. And the format there is first and last, or maybe we have some helpful information. So in the P underscore device underscore ID column, they're between a range of zero to four. Let's go ahead and run that alter table command. Then we can describe the health tracker process table. Let's double check on our comments. We'll use describe with extended again and we can now see our comments that we added, as well as some additional information. In step four, we want to count the records in the health tracker processed table. We'll count the records with Apache Spark. With Delta Lake, the Delta table requires no repair and it is immediately ready for use. So we have health tracker processed. We read in the table health tracker processed. Then we're going to run that dot count method. We'd expect 3,720 files here because we haven't done anything to the table yet. Our assert statement passes because that's true. Now let's create a new Delta table. We're going to remove all the files in the health tracker user analytics directory which makes our notebook idempotent. So we set the path, which is just one string towards our working path, specifically in gold and health tracker user analytics. Then we take Spark configuration and we set the user analytics path. This makes this available in SQL. We're gonna run some SQL commands, drop table if exists, the health tracker gold user analytics and remove any files. Great. Now let's create an aggregate data frame. So I'm going to read in the health tracker process table and run some aggregated statistics on top of that table. Recall that our gold level has aggregated statistics. So we can imagine that maybe there's some downstream user that wants high level stats. Here, we're gonna run a group by on the device ID, and then our stats, we'll use the aggregate function. We'll take the average of the heart rate column, the max of the heart rate column, and then maybe the standard deviation of the heart rate column. Once we understand what those statistics are, we will create a new column that we alias as average heart rate, max heart rate, and standard deviation heart rate. Then we can write the delta files. So we will take the object that we just created, this data frame, health tracker gold user analytics, and we'll write in the format delta this time with a mode of overwrite to the user analytics path. Now that we've written the Delta file, let's go ahead and register the Delta table in the meta store. We're gonna use create table on health tracker gold user analytics using Delta, and we'll write it to that path from earlier.
to double check our work, let's go ahead and run a spark.read table and then pass that into a display function. And we can see all of our gold level data. We have the device ID and then the average heart rate, given that a device ID, the max heart rate, given the device ID, and the standard deviation, given the ID. We could also turn this into a visualization and look at things like given a device ID, what was maybe our standard deviation heart rate? Great work. Let's jump in now to a discussion about the transaction log or commit service. The transaction log and commit service are what enable most of the really neat and exciting features on Delta Lake. The Delta Lake transaction log also known as the Delta log, is an ordered record of every transaction that has ever been performed on a Delta Lake table since its inception. What is the transaction log used for? It's a single source of truth. Delta Lake is built on top of Apache Spark in order to allow multiple readers and writers of a given table to work on the table at the same time. In order to show users correct views of the data at all times, the Delta Lake transaction log serves as a single source of truth, the central repository that tracks all changes that users make to a table. When a user reads a Delta Lake table for the first time or runs a new query on an open table that has been modified since the last time it was read, Spark checks the transaction log to see what new transactions have posted to the table and then updates the end user's table with those new changes. This ensures that a user's version of a table is always synchronized with the master record as of the most recent query, and that users cannot make divergent, conflicting changes to a table. One of the four properties of ACID transactions, atomicity, guarantees that operations like an insert or update performed on your data lake either complete fully or don't complete at all. Without this property, it's far too easy for a hardware failure or a software bug to cause data to be only partially written to a table, resulting in messy or corrupted data. The transaction log is the mechanism through which Delta Lake is able to offer the guarantee of atomicity. For all intents and purposes, if it's not recorded in the transaction log, it never happened. But only recording transactions that execute fully and completely, and using that record as a single source of truth, the Delta Lake transaction log allows users to reason about their data and have peace of mind about its fundamental trustworthiness at petabyte scale. Once we've made a total of 10 commits to the transaction log, Delta Lake saves a checkpoint file in parquet format. In the same underscore delta underscore log subdirectory. Delta Lake automatically generates checkpoint files every 10 commits. These checkpoint files save the entire state of the table at a point in time in native Parquet format that is quick and easy for Spark to read. In other words, they offer the Spark reader a sort of shortcut to fully reproducing a table state that allows Spark to avoid reprocessing what could be thousands of tiny, inefficient JSON files. To get up to speed, Spark can run a list from operation to view all of the files in the transaction log, quickly skip to the newest checkpoint file and only process those JSON commits made since the most recent checkpoint file was saved. To demonstrate how this works, Imagine that we've created commits all the way through 00007.json 
as we can see in the diagram. Spark is up to speed through this commit, having automatically cached the most recent version of the table in memory. In the meantime, though, several other writers, perhaps your overly eager teammates, have written new data to the table all the way through 000012.json. To incorporate these new transactions and update the state of our table, Spark will run a list from version 7 operation to see the new changes in the table. Rather than processing all of the intermediate JSON files, Spark can skip ahead to the most recent checkpoint file since it contains the entire state of the table at commit number 10. Now, Spark only has to perform incremental processing of 000011.json and 000012.json to have the current state of the table. Spark then caches version 12 of the table in memory. By following this workflow, Delta Lake is able to use Spark to keep the state of a table updated at all times in an efficient manner. Now that we understand how the Delta Lake transaction log works at a high level, let's talk about concurrency. So far, our examples have mostly covered scenarios in which users commit transactions linearly, or at least without conflict. But what happens when Delta Lake is dealing with multiple concurrent reads and writes? The answer is simple. Since Delta Lake is powered by Apache Spark, it is not only possible for multiple users to modify a table at once, it is expected. To handle these situations, Delta Lake employs optimistic concurrency control. For example, imagine that you and I are working on a jigsaw puzzle together. As long as we're both working on different parts of it, you on the corners, me on the edges, for example, there is no reason why we can't each work on our part of the bigger puzzle at the same time and finish the puzzle twice as fast. It's only when we need the same pieces at the same time that there's a conflict. That's optimistic concurrency control. Of course, even with optimistic concurrency control, sometimes users do try to modify the same parts of the data at the same time. Luckily, Delta Lake has a protocol for that. In order to offer ACID transactions, Delta Lake has a protocol for figuring out how commits should be ordered known as the concept of serializability in databases and determining what to do in the event that two or more commits are made at the same time. Delta Lake handles these cases by implementing a rule of mutual exclusion, then attempting to solve any conflict optimistically. This protocol allows Delta Lake to deliver on the ACID principle of isolation, the I which ensures that the resulting state of the table after multiple concurrent writes is the same as if those writes had occurred serially in isolation from one another. In general, the process proceeds like this. Record the starting table version, record reads and writes, attempt a commit. If someone else wins, check whether anything you read has changed and then repeat. All right, we are in LWD04 batch write to Delta tables. In this notebook, we're going to append some files onto an existing Delta table. Recall that in the previous notebook, we created that Delta table. So I'm gonna start out by running the cell that says run includes classroom setup. Okay, 
great. Now that's completed, we are going to load in some new data. So if we think about our data ingestion pipeline again, this is the addition of new raw files to our single source of truth. We're going to begin by loading data from the health underscore tracker underscore data underscore 2020 underscore two dot JSON using the format JSON option like we did last time. And if you recall, prior to this notebook, we were loading in a file that looks extremely similar to this one, except that it was ended with underscore one. So now you can imagine we're loading in some new data. The real life example here might be that we have new customer records that we want to append onto our table. So I'm going to run by declaring this file path, which tells the next line where I do a spark.read format JSON and I load in from that particular file path. So now I've read this into a data frame in Spark. I want to transform that data. So I'm going to use a function that we used in the last notebook. This is the uh, from Unix time Spark SQL function. Then we're going to cast that time column to the time timestamp. And then we're going to cast the time column uh, to date. And then we'll uh, create a new column called DTE. We'll call that our process DF. And we're going to append data to the health tracker process delta table. And what we'll do here is we'll write, write out, so we'll say process data frame, which is created in this previous cell. And we're going to append on to that delta table. How we know that we're appending on is we write dot mode append. And what the format here is, is delta. And where we're going to save it to is stored in that DA paths processed. So we're now appending data on to that delta table. As simple as that. Okay, now if we wanted to go back to a previous version of our data, let's say we had a use case where we had to prove what our data set looked like at a previous step. We now have stored all of the information about our delta table in the commit service. So if we think about that commit service right and think of the delta log, we could go backwards in time to another version. The way that we can do that is we say version as of and then set back to a previous version number. So here we're going to time travel back to version zero and we'll only see that first month of data, those five device measurements. So I'm gonna say spark.read option version as of underscore zero with the format delta and I'm going to load in from that same da.paths.processed and then we'll just count the records. Okay, by counting the records we get an output here 3720 which matches our previous count of records. And now since we have added on new records when we query that table if we don't specify a previous version, then we'll just show the latest version. So for example, let's say we're reading in data from January 2020, as well as February 2020. And if we imagine like the underscore one was January and the underscore two was February, we should now have uh, five device worth of data for 60 days times 24 hours. So there should be 7,200 records.
okay, great. We have 7,128 records. So we're missing roughly 72 records. Uh, this is to be expected though. Now that we've learned a little bit about the commit service, let's go into another component of Delta Lake, the Delta engine. Because Delta Lake is specifically designed to be used with Apache Spark, reads and writes made to Delta tables benefit from the inherent massively parallel processing capabilities of Apache Spark. When Apache Spark code is run to read and write to Delta Lake, the following optimizations are available through the Delta engine. File management optimizations, including compaction, data skipping, and localized data storage, auto-optimized writes, and performance optimization via Delta caching. Delta Engine offers auto-optimize, which gives you automatic compaction, or bin packing. This solves streaming small file problems. Data skipping helps identify which parts of files can and cannot be skipped. So consider a simple SQL query, select star from a table named points, where x is 2 or y is 3. Data skipping allows us to skip over the parts of data that are not going to be read. We can read in each part file and test for x is 2 or y is 3. And in this case, we can see that we have nine files that were scanned on the left-hand side, and there were 21 false positives. With z-ording, though, we only scanned seven files and had 13 false positives. So what is data skipping? It's a simple, well-known IO pruning technique used by many database management systems and big data systems, also known as small materialized aggregates, zone maps, or column store index. Some performance features of Delta include optimize, which is a command that bin packs files to the right size, auto optimize, which takes small and large files compacted to enable data lake applications to experience great consistent performance and scalability, scalable writes, which give you fine grain conflict resolution, Data skipping, which improves read performance by only reading a subset of the files. Z ordering, which clusters files in a way that enable data skipping for multi-dimensional filters. Bloom filters, which improve read performance by only reading subsets of the files that have data matching user filters. Caching, which automatically caches input, delta, and parquet tables a skew join which supports joining two data sets with severe data skew and range join which is useful for time series data this supports joining two data sets based on overlapping ranges great work we're coming up on the two hour mark which means that we're roughly halfway through this entire lesson now Let's continue working through our pipeline. We're going to look at notebooks five through eight. I'll see you over in the platform. Okay, now we're going to be exploring the single source of truth. So I've got notebook LWD05 open and I've got my cluster started. In this notebook, we're gonna work through identifying late arriving data and bad data. You can imagine we have our pipeline set up, some Delta tables created, and now we have some new data coming in. Maybe that data came in at a later point in time, or maybe that data was bad or corrupt for some sort of reason, and we want to figure out how do we fix that. So we'll start out by running our classroom setup script.
Okay. And then we want to count the number of records per device. So we're going to run a query. We're going to count up the number of records uh, that we have. We're going to tell Spark that our format is a delta table. And uh, we can do that using that format method. And instead of passing in the path like we did in previous notebooks, we're going to pass in the health tracker variable from da.paths.processed. And then we'll do a group by and an aggregation on that uh, partition column, so device ID. OK, let's start out. The first thing we want to do is import uh, the count function. So we'll have, say, from functions import count. OK, and then let's just do everything in one shot. So we'll do display. And we'll do spark dot read. And then we want to read in format delta, like it says up above. And actually, let's go ahead and just start horizontal alignment there. And then we want to load from a particular path. In our case, that path that we want to load from is da.paths. processed. And then we can run a group by. And we're going to group by that p underscore device underscore ID. It looks so weird. Okay. And then we'll run an aggregate and we will count on everything. Okay. So we have a spark.read and then we have a format. We're going to format it with delta. And we will load it from that DA paths processed. Then we're going to run a group by on the device ID column. And finally, we'll do a count. Okay, so given device ID, we can see there's a count of 1,440 records. Or given device four, let's say, we can see that there's a count of 1,368 records. Awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and plot the missing records. So here, we want to run a query to discover the timing of the missing records. And we can imagine that um, at some point, right, like some server shut down or shut down, and then we want to know um, when did those particular records not come into our data set. So here we're going to use a visualization and we're going to display the number of records per day. So when we run this code, it's already written out for us. We scroll through. We can see just kind of by like eyeballing the data over on the far right side that there's no data for device four. Everything's device three in the last few days of the month. So if we go down to the very bottom, whoops, we can see that we've got data all the way up until the 11th here. Unlike if we go to Device three, we can see that we had records going all the way up until the 31st. So there's probably some data missing. And let's go ahead and make a visualization of that. So instead of having to eyeball and scroll through all of that, what we could do is create a visual. Okay, so as a default here, we can see that we have the time against the P device ID with the values of P device ID. Let's kind of just play around with that a little bit and see what we can come up with. Maybe some more useful information as a way to visualize our data. So maybe what we'll do is take the name and that'll be the grouping. Okay, already we can see that we have a completely different input and then maybe we'll take the keys here. Okay, so now the keys I have 
uh, the date, and then series groupings, the name, and then values, I have the P uh, device ID. So I'm just gonna apply that. And this is just another way to visualize my data, right? I can see that towards the end here, we run out of dates where James has anything and Min has data. Let's try configuring now to this version. So I'm gonna pull up the plot options again and the key here is again gonna be the date. This time though, the series groupings is going to be device ID and then the values are gonna be heart rate. And instead of doing a sum, this time we're just gonna do a count. Another way to go about this, it'll be a bar chart again. And here we can see that we have missing days for a particular time period. Awesome. Okay, so this means that we have broken readings, right? Uh, we note that there are broken records. We also see that there are negative readings uh, that were present, even though it's impossible to record a negative heart rate. So let's check out the extent of broken readings in our table. And the way that we can go about that is we'll create a new data frame called broken readings. And that's gonna be assigned to spark.read and we're gonna read it a delta and we want to load from that da dot paths dot processed okay And then we want to select a couple of these columns. So let's select the column for heart rate. Where the heart rate is negative and be, because right that would make very very little sense why would anyone's heart rate be negative I don't even think you're dead at that point I think you're a zombie so we're gonna group by the date and then we'll do an aggregate count the heart rate and then let's also just do like a little bit of sorting so we'll say order by and dd and order by has that kind of like camel case so oh and also i forgot i need to write in call parentheses DTEs because we're selecting both the column heart rate and the column date. So that's how we read and everything. And now let's go ahead and check out and create that a, make that into a view. So we'll do broken underscore readings dot create or replace temp view. It's going to be called Broken Readings. Awesome. Okay, so we create a temporary view for this Broken Readings table. Now we can just even use SQL. So I'm just going to do a select star from Broken Readings. And we have our two columns that we selected on line five here, heart rate and DTE. So here's the date and then Given that date, here is our heart rate. OK, 
Okay, now let's sum together all the records in that view. And we can see that there are 60 records here. All right. Okay, so now I've got notebook LWD06, upsert into a delta table open. In this notebook, we're gonna repair the records that we have with an upsert. So we saw in the previous notebooks that there were 72 missing records, and also there were 60 met records with broken readings. So in this lesson, we wanna repair the table by modifying the health underscore tracker underscore uh, process table. So what we'll do first is run our classroom setup. Okay, and then we want to create a data frame where we take in our broken values and we are going to partition on that device ID. So first things first, there are a couple functions I know that are going to pop up. I'm going to do a from PySpark.SQL dot window Just import a window function real quick and then also from pyspark dot sql okay now the first thing we're going to do is create a window on our partition. So let's do DTE, and I'm gonna do some camel case here. Take that window and partition by. P underscore device ID. And then I'm gonna order by Okay, then I'm gonna take my interpolated uh, data frame. Interpolated. Spark.read, and I wanna read a table. Health tracker process. some selects so let's select some columns specifically DTE but let's also select column time oh I forgot a comma and then let's select column heart rate. And then let's create a new column. So we're gonna use that partition over the date time. And we'll use the heart rate column to see what our previous and our uh, next amount are. So we'll say, take the lag of column heart rate over that DTE window and we'll alias this one as the previous amount and then we'll figure out what the lead was so in other words, like what our next value will be by looking at the column heart rate. And 
And same thing here over the DT window. Oops. And we'll alias this one as next amount. Okay, we're also going to select that column called name. And then finally, the p underscore device underscore ID. Okay. Uh, I got an error on expression heart rate not supported within a window. Oh, I can see on lines 12 and 13, my parentheses are in the wrong spot. So I'm going to just switch those around. Okay, so I'm gonna move, I have the lag column here with the parentheses and then we're going to lag over the date time uh, window and then we'll alias that as the previous amount then we have the lead we're going to look at the heart rate again and we're going to go window function over the date window and then we will alias that as the next amount we're also going to select the name and the device ID when running that we get output of these columns. So we just created these two new columns, right? We aliased and we have previous amount and next amount. Okay, so now let's create a data frame of updates. So we wanna look where the heart rate is less than zero. And then we're also gonna look at where the previous amount and next amount divided by two. And we will uh, divide that and create the heart rate. Then let's look at the schemas. So the way that we can find schemas using print schema. So we'll say spark dot read dot format. Delta and then let's do a dot load. path and then finally just a print schema and actually let's format that a little bit so we'll just move this down there, there, and there. Okay, so that prints out the schema. We could also have a look at the updates.df.print schema. And we can see that it pops up the same thing. So two different ways to go about that, right? We can load it directly from and then print out the schema or we could just run on that updates that we created a moment ago. Okay, let's just double check on our updates data frame. We wanna make sure that the this should have the um, same as the broken readings view that we had in our previous notebook. And it does, it pops out with 60. So let's go ahead and make a insert data frame. This code's already all written out for you. We're gonna just declare the path, and then we will read in the late arriving data. And then we want to count the number of records. I'll give you a second. I'll pause here and see if you can recall what the code is to count the records. Okay, I'll try it out. Let's go health 
underscore tracker underscore data 2020 to late df. And hopefully you got this. Uh, the method we're looking for is count. And that gives us 72, which is the number of late arriving records. Now we want to process and transform that data. So we'll use that same function that we used earlier. It takes things from Unix time, and then it's going to change that time column into a new one uh, using a timestamp date type, and then using that time column to a date. And we will alias that as column DTE. So we'll call that the insert data frame. So basically we just kind of clean up our late arriving data. When we look at our schema of data using print schema, we can see that we have the uh, date, time, the heart rate, the name. And all of these are nullable column columns, right? We can see nullable is true, nullable is true, and so on and so on. And so if we union that with the inserts data frame, and then we look at the resulting schema, we should have the exact same columns. So we still have the date, the time, the heart rate, the name, and the device ID. Now let's work on an upsert. So with an upsert, we're gonna take delta table, and then we're gonna match where our health tracker time is the same as the upsert's time. So here's our process delta table. And we're also gonna look for where the health tracker device ID is the same as the upsert's device ID. Then we wanna update the new heart rate. So basically we'll take the table that we had and then do an upsert. So kind of like an insert, right? We're gonna insert anything from the upsert's device ID, upsert's heart rate, upsert's name, time, and date. Okay, so here we have the merge. We're gonna merge from the upsert's data frame and we'll alias that as upsert's. When we have matched, then we set as the update. When it's not matched, then just insert the values and then an execute to trigger everything at the very end. Okay, now let's look at that commit using time travel. So recall now, if we look at version as of two, we can look at the first two months of data minus those 72 records. So again, that gives us that 7,128. Now, if we count the most recent version of health tracker, so I do spark.read table on health tracker processed, We've upserted those records and now there's 7,200. If we want to describe the history of the health tracker process table, we can use the history command. And this is everything that's happened on this processed delta table. So we can get, see a timestamp along with the user ID and username, and then an operation as well. Okay. Now, if we want to sum together the broken readings, take a second and try writing out some code, and then I'll follow up alongside you with you. If you need a help, you can look at the instructions here where we say, in the previous lesson, we performed an upsert to that health tracker process table, which updated records containing broken readings. We inserted late arriving data, and we inadvertently added more broken readings. So let's double check. OK. 
Okay, I'm just going to start right behind you probably. I'll say from PySpark SQL functions. Okay, and then we're going to create a table called broken readings. And that's going to be from spark.read. In format delta so we'll load in from that one path da dot paths dot process We will select the necessary columns. And since we're looking for the broken readings, we can just look for where the heart rate where the column heart rate is less than zero. Then we can do a group by on the dates. So we'll say group by date column and aggregate together account of the heart rate. And we can order by the date. Okay, and then we're going to create that temporary view again. So we'll say broken readings dot create or replace temporary view broken underscore readings. Forgot to select the other column, DT. Okay, so now everything looks proper. So I missed that column, DT right here. Let's make sure that these are new broken readings. So we'll look for where the daytime is less than 2020-02-25 and we can see that there are no broken readings before 2020-02-25. So let's go ahead and verify the updates. We'll do accounts on the updates data frame view. Go ahead and take a second and see if you can write out this code. Okay, this should have the same number of records as the sum that we performed on that broken readings view. So let's go ahead and write out updates, data frame, and we're gonna do a count. It pops up with one. And we're going to create the upsurge data frame now. 
and we will merge in together from the upserts in a match. When there's a match, we set as the update. When it's not match, insert the values. Okay, and then let's sum together the records in the broken readings view one more time. And we can see that we have only one row and that's a null. Okay, now we're gonna talk about schema enforcement and evolution. So we're gonna work through the idea of our schema changing. We can imagine like a column getting added to our data set, or maybe that column for some reason changes its type, something like that. In a lot of systems, this becomes a point of contention. We're gonna see how Delta handles for this. So the first thing we wanna do is run the includes classroom setup script. And if we look at a sample of our data while that's running, we can see we've got columns, right? It's a JSON object, so we've got like device ID and then some number attached to that and then heart rate and some number attached to that, the user's name, the time that the measurement was taken, and then uh, the type of device, so version one, version two, that kind of thing. Each of these columns has its own data type. So if we look at the name column, right, we can imagine it'd probably be a string, and that's true. Heart rate is a double, right? We've got floating decimal points over there. Device ID is an integer, time is a long, and then device type is a string. The only one that doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but I've seen this now in this data set, but time being a long, I realize that's a Unix time, so then I can say, okay, well, that makes sense. Okay, if we're gonna load the next month of data, we will load health underscore tracker underscore data underscore 2020, and then 3.json. Okay. We're going to declare a file path, and that is the exact same file path as earlier. It's just that this time we have underscore three, and we're going to read in and create a variable called health tracker data 2023 data frame. Okay, let's transform the data. So, similar to earlier, we have our from Unix and from Unix time. Then we're going to leave heart rate and name alone. We're going to cast device ID as P underscore device ID to show that we're partitioning it. But then we're adding in a device type and we're going to leave that alone as well. Okay, so now we basically have this new column, right? Device type. What are we going to do to see how that gets appended on? So if we wanted to just append our data as is, Remember, we have our old data, which didn't have that device type. Okay, I get this error. It says, analysis exception, a schema mismatch is detected when writing to the delta table, table ID, so on and so on and so on. So this was the original table. We have the root with these five columns date, time, heart rate, name, and device ID. And then this new schema that tried to come in, the date, time, heart rate, name, device ID, and device type. So this new column adds on, and there is a schema mismatch. And we can see right in here, Delta actually explains how to overcome this. So if we wanna enable schema migration using Data Frame Writer, we set an option of merge schema to true. And just like the notebook says, that error, a schema mismatch detected when writing the delta table, means that there's a mismatch between our columns. If we want to enable that, like we said in the error, we saw that you can set the option merge schema to true. Another way to go about that is to set a session configuration. So we say spark.databricks.delta.schema.automerge.enabled to true. Schema enforcement, which is also known as schema validation, 
is a safeguard in Delta Lake that makes sure that you have data quality by rejecting any right to a table that does not match the table schema. However, we know that in practice, schemas evolve over time. So schema evolution is a feature that allows users to easily change the table's current schema to accommodate data that is changing over time. A lot of times it's used when we are doing an append or an overwrite operation. We automatically adapt the schema to include one or more of the new columns. So here we want to append a new column on and we're going to set that option to true. So we'll say the processed df dot right and the mode here will be append and then the option will be we're going to set merge schema to true and then the format that we want here of course is delta and then we're going to tell it to save in that same path where we've been saving da.paths.process Okay, and then I like to format my code a little bit, so I'm going to just go ahead and make this code a little more vertical. Okay, so I run that. And then the last thing I want to do is count the most recent version. So I'm going to do a read table and then count and the total number of records that I see pop out are 10,920 and that's exactly how many I expect on this one so everything looks good okay so now we have built out our pipeline and we have fixed out the broken records let's imagine that we have to follow along with some regulations like GDPR or CCPA, the General Data Protection Regulation or California Consumer Privacy Act. These are regulations that require us to remove data if a user wants us to at some fairly granular levels. So what we might want to do is delete records associated with, let's say, a particular device ID. In this notebook, we're going to go through that process. So we're going to delete a single user's records. We're going to go ahead and run our classroom setup. And let's say we want to delete all of the records for device four. So we're going to import from delta dot tables, delta table. And we're going to read delta table for path on that DA paths processed. And specifically, we want to delete where the device ID is four. So people who have written SQL before, this look, might look something kind of like a where clause, or if you've done any kind of delete, delete where, that kind of thing. Okay, in the previous lesson, we deleted all the records from the health tracker process table let's say we don't remove all their data, but they just want to have their name scrubbed from a system. So what we'll do is use time travel to recover everything but the user's name. What we're going to do first is prepare a new upserts view, and then we'll use that to time travel. So let's go ahead and import the lit function from pyspark. SQL dot functions import lit. Then we're going to create an upserts data frame, and that's going to be equivalent to Spark dot read. Uh, 
option and we're gonna read the version as of number five okay a couple of other things that we want to do here let's go ahead and tell it that we want the format of Delta and we want to load from that path that we've been loading from paths dot processed where the device ID is four and we're gonna select the date column the time column heart rate column of literals none type and we'll alias that as the name and then finally the p underscore device underscore ID okay so now we have a new upserts view, and then we can perform an upsert into that health tracker process table. So basically we take that column of all nuns and insert into the table where the name once was. Okay, to do that, let's go ahead and say we need the processed delta table and that is going to be delta table path spark and then we want da dot paths dot processed okay then we want an update match so we're gonna match basically where the tracker time and the upsearch time match and the device ID and the upsearch device ID match so the match is health underscore tracker dot time is matched with the upserts dot time and health underscore tracker is the same as the upserts okay now let's describe the update Upserts dot heart rate. Then we want to insert the device ID. So we have P underscore device underscore ID. 
into upserts dot p device id heart rate We'll get updated with the heart rate. Oh, forgetting commas again. The name. We'll get updated with the upserts dot name. Time. Upserts dot time. Okay, so now we have our updates and then we also have our inserts. Let's go ahead and merge the two. So we have our processed delta table. Just alias it as health tracker. We're going to perform a merge where we take the upserts data frame, which will be alias as upserts. The update match. We'll say when it's matched update. We want to do set as the update and when it's not a matched insert the values will be our insert and then finally we want to execute Okay, oh, let's clean this up just a little bit there. So there. Okay. Great. Actually, since that's back, we'll just move it right there. Great, okay. Okay, so we have our process delta table. We're gonna look for some sort of matching logic then when we have, uh, we will update. Otherwise, we're gonna insert values. Okay, looks great. Okay, now we're gonna count the most recent version. Uh, when we look at this current version, we should see five devices times 24 hours times uh, 31 days, 29 days, 31 days. So we should have 10,920 records. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this next cell. It's already written out for us. Awesome. We see 10,920 records. Now we want to query device four to make sure that we are compliant. And in order to do that, we're going to look read from format delta and we're going to look where device id is for and we can see here that for device id is for we've erased the name exactly like the user wanted us to do awesome great job
Okay, another way we can see that uh, we are still out of compliance is that we could query against an earlier version to identify with the name associated to device four. So because of that time travel feature, we actually sort of are out of luck. We can get around that by querying the health tracker process table against early version first off just to show so if I look at like version 2 right the name is still in there James is right there let's use vacuum and what vacuum will do is recursively vacuum directories associated with the delta table and remove files that are no longer in the latest state of the transaction log the default is seven days. Here, we run, we get this little warning. Are you sure you want to like vacuum files with such a low retention period? If you're certain there are no operations to be performed on this table, then you can turn it off by setting this configuration fault. So what we'll do is we'll set this configuration spark.databricks.delta, retention, duration check, enabled. We'll set that to false. And then now we can vacuum like we just tried to do. Okay, so now we've vacuumed. And then if we try to go to an earlier version, let's say four, All right, congratulations. We covered a lot of ground in this course, so let's do a quick high-level summary to talk about Delta Lake. Delta Lake, in summary, is a core component of the lake house architecture. It offers guaranteed consistency because it's ACID compliant. It's a robust data store and it's designed to work with Apache Spark. Thank you very much for attending this training. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Please take time to fill out the survey. It helps our training improve and iterate.